For centuries, the British royal family thrived on secrecy, so maybe it's no wonder that we learned so little about the royal's many health issues. From eating disorders to emergency surgeries, these are the problems the palace tried hardest to hide. Today, George III's troubled mental health is one of the few things most people know about him. I believe we too can make Britain great. You as the Prince Regent, and I as King Penguin. <laughs> But that's not entirely fair, as George enjoyed a few years where he was able to rule on his own, starting in 1760 and lasting until his first instance of serious instability in 1788-89. to He actually recovered from this extended episode, but recurring struggles with mental illness left him unable to act as king by 1810. This remained the case until his death in 1820. What did the British public know about their king's illness? Not a whole lot. Most understood the king was sick, as his doctors routinely issued bulletins that gave updates on his condition. But those were often kept purposefully vague. Instead of giving detailed information about George and how he was being treated, these documents were more an attempt to soothe public worries. But while these reports tried to soothe the fears of an unstable monarchy, they also fed into the growing sense of the royals as public figures whose activities were fodder for the flourishing British newspaper industry. Though readers might not have known that the king was subjected to treatments that involved straitjackets and forced isolation, they certainly had a sense that not all was well within the dynasty. By the end of his days, George VI was in a pretty bad way. The father of Queen Elizabeth II, who had been a heavy smoker for much of his life, suffered from hardening of the arteries, dealt with severe leg and foot pain, and underwent a 1949 operation to remove part of his right lung. By 1951, doctors concluded that he had lung cancer. In September of that year, surgeons working in an impromptu operating room set up in Buckingham Palace removed George's left lung and part of a nearby nerve. This procedure appeared to slow his speech afterward. Yet despite public bulletins that addressed the king's wavering health, none appear to have mentioned his cancer. George himself may not have known that a cancer diagnosis was on the table, and not all of the king's doctors were fully aware of his condition either. When the king was found dead in his bedroom in Sandringham on February 6, 1952, the doctor who attended the scene said he had died of a coronary thrombosis, yet no autopsy was ever performed to confirm this. When the reality of his condition came out decades later, doctors and historians suggested that the royal family had covered it up because they wanted to project the image of a stable monarchy and avoid the perceived shame of a cancer diagnosis. Fans of the Crown will be well aware that Queen Elizabeth II's sister, Princess Margaret, suffered a number of mental health issues throughout her life. For a while there, it was touch and go. Back then, however, the palace took pains to hide many of Margaret's mental health issues from the public. It didn't help that Margaret had a considerable smoking habit that reportedly saw her smoke up to 60 cigarettes per day. Her addictions eventually grew to include alcohol, which often began with a vodka-laced breakfast. Her marriage to photographer Anthony Armstrong Jones deteriorated through the 60s and 70s and caused serious personal upset. Margaret retreated to the private Caribbean island of Mystique to recuperate, but she reportedly suffered a nervous breakdown in 1974. Her physical ailments eventually became widespread known. At the time of her death in 2002, the public was well aware of her three strokes, a lung biopsy, pulmonary issues, and hepatitis, among other maladies. But Margaret's mental health struggles were kept quiet. There was some talk of her breakdown in the press, but it took a long time for the public to learn that Margaret sought treatment for depression, as well as her attempts at self-harm. That was in part due to her family's penchant for ignoring inconvenient issues. During one party, Margaret reportedly threatened to throw herself out of her bedroom window. When her sister was called, Queen Elizabeth was said to have shrugged it off, saying, her bedroom is on the ground floor. When then Prince Charles fell off his horse during a 2001 polo match, news outlets casually referred to the incident as a tumble. But in a 2006 interview, which aired in the US on Dateline, Charles revealed that his so-called tumble was far more serious than it had seemed. Charles said, I was trying too hard. I had to turn the pony very fast, and the next thing, the pony came down sideways and I must have landed absolutely smack on my head. He claimed that Harry had thought his father was snoring, adding, and there I was busily swallowing my tongue and quietly dying. Even if that particular detail was something of an exaggeration, Charles very obviously suffered a head trauma that knocked him unconscious. This could easily have been a serious, if not deadly, injury. Charles survived, of course, but it's now obvious that his love of polo had an often undiscussed effect on his physical health. Harry later wrote in his memoir, Spare, that Charles still deals with the painful after-effects of his polo career. According to Harry, Charles could sometimes be found doing headstands to deal with the lingering issues. He wrote, Prescribed by his physio, these exercises were the only effective remedy for the constant pain in Pa's neck and back. Even before the reality of her failing marriage came to light, Princess Diana appeared to have been suffering from the pressure of a royal life. After her marriage to Prince Charles in 1981, Diana reportedly suffered from bouts of crying, insomnia, paranoia, and the early signs of an eating disorder. As some have since claimed, Diana also showed a tendency towards suicidal ideation and self-harm. Charles was reportedly confused and upset by his new wife's troubles. Eventually, their relationship crumbled. 
the marriage was becoming harmful to the monarchy, and royal patience finally snapped. Privately, the royal family attempted to address Diana's mental health, though she was reportedly resistant to taking medication or speaking to a therapist. Queen Elizabeth even asked Harry Herbert, a family friend and royal racing manager, to check in with the princess. Yet as far as the public was concerned, the details of Diana's mental health remained secret even as her marriage imploded. It wasn't until after Charles and Diana separated in December 1992 that Diana began to openly discuss her mental health. That resulted in an increased number of people seeking help for eating disorders and mental illness, though the effect eventually waned. Decades later, the royal family reportedly attempted to conceal another member's similar struggles, as Meghan Markle claimed that her own depression had been ignored by the palace, as getting help was reportedly deemed to be too potentially damaging to the family's image. I had known for a long time and had been asking the institution for help for quite a, a long time. On November 10, 2003, the public was informed that Prince Edward and his wife Sophie, then the Earl and Countess of Wessex, had welcomed a baby girl. The official royal announcement noted that Sophie had undergone an emergency C-section, forcing Edward to rush back from an overseas engagement. The premature girl Louise was kept in the NICU. However, the announcement made it seem that all was well, calling the NICU stay precautionary and claiming that both mother and newborn were doing well. Yet Sophie's childbirth experience was genuinely dire. She went into labor about four weeks early, and at the hospital, medical staff determined that she had a placental abruption, a serious problem in which the placenta begins to separate from the uterus. This is a potential emergency, as the mother can experience dangerously heavy bleeding, and the fetus may be deprived of oxygen. Louise was safely delivered, though Sophie required a large blood transfusion and reportedly came dangerously close to death. Even after she became stable, she was unable to see her daughter and faced a long physical and mental recovery. Of course, it's not as if Sophie was morally obligated to make her traumatic birth experience public knowledge in what must have been an incredibly difficult time. Still, when the reality of her first birth became more widely known over a decade later, many people who remembered a rather sedate royal announcement found themselves quite shocked. In 2020, the beginnings of the COVID-19 pandemic sent the world into a flurry of lockdowns, mask mandates, and widespread uncertainty. Prince Charles first contracted the virus in March 2020, then again in 2022, the same year that both his wife and his mother caught it. All experienced relatively mild forms of COVID-19 and were never hospitalized. But for much of 2020, the family kept a secret. Prince William had been sick too. In November of that year, the Sun broke the news that William had contracted COVID the previous April and, despite taking part in 14 remote engagements, had been fairly ill. Other sources claimed he was fine. After all, he did maintain a fairly full work schedule while isolated. Either way, when William finally admitted that he had been sick, he claimed to have kept it quiet because he didn't want to worry the British public. By 2021, it was clear that Queen Elizabeth was beginning to slow down. On the throne since 1952, she had ruled for over 70 years, making her the longest reigning British monarch in history. But even with access to top-notch private medical care, time comes for everyone. Yet when the Queen had to call off an engagement in October 2021, Buckingham Palace made it seem as if the then 95-year-old monarch was briefly stepping away from her duties because her physicians had simply told her to rest. So the question arising out of this is, uh, is it maybe time for the Queen to slow down a bit more permanently? But Elizabeth was not taking it easy at home. As news outlets soon reported, she had actually been admitted to a hospital for a one-night stay, undergoing unspecified tests for an unknown reason. Though it appeared that she wasn't infected with COVID-19, and spokespeople claimed that the Queen's medical team was simply being cautious, little else has since emerged about that brief hospital stay. By this time, the Queen's health had become a subject of considerable debate. What exactly was going on with her? Reports surfaced that she privately used a wheelchair to deal with mobility issues, though she was set on never letting the public see her using one. Some even speculated that she had been diagnosed with a form of bone cancer, though that has never been confirmed. At the time of Queen Elizabeth II's death on September 8, 2022, it had become obvious that her health was declining. Previously, she had been put under medical supervision, but details as to why never emerged. Even when her death certificate was released later that month, the listed cause of death did little to explain what contributed to her passing. It simply read, old age. Whether or not someone can really die of old age is a matter of debate among medical professionals. Some argue that advanced age is a legitimate cause of death on its own. After all, it is one of the top causes of death in Japan. Yet others argue that a senior's declining body and failing immune system opens them up to any number of complications, which should then be deemed the cause of death. If you ascribe to the latter point of view, Queen Elizabeth's death certificate is frustratingly vague. Some sources claim that Elizabeth was perhaps in far worse health than many outsiders suspected. One told the Daily Beast that by the end of her life, the Queen was often in a wheelchair and suffered from a variety of pains, declining senses, and cognitive issues, though her death reportedly still caught close family members off guard. A more specific cause of death could clear this up, of course, but the simple fact is that we may never learn the full truth of Elizabeth's final days. 
In January 2024, Kate Middleton, the future queen, suddenly dipped out of the spotlight. A statement from Kensington Palace claimed she was undergoing planned abdominal surgery. Though the procedure reportedly went well, no one specified what kind of surgery Kate had needed and why she required such a long private recovery. Her husband, Prince William, continued with his duties until February 27th when he missed a memorial service for his godfather. Then, on March 10th, Kate shared a Mother's Day photo of herself and her three children online. Observers noted that the image had been awkwardly edited, to the point that major news agencies pulled the photo from circulation. The image fueled already swirling rumors around the nature of the surgery and the state of Kate and William's marriage, but no full explanation was given given by the palace. Even an apparent public appearance was greeted with suspicion by conspiracy-minded commenters, while the nature of the surgery remained mysterious. Then, on March 22nd, the princess made a public announcement that many were expecting. Tests following the surgery had revealed cancer, and she had begun chemotherapy in February. This, of course, came as a huge shock, and William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately. No further details were disclosed. If you or someone you know is struggling or in crisis, help is available. Call or text 988 or chat 988lifeline.org.